We close out 2017 with another best of episode. This is former Academy of St. Martin in the field's bassist, Leon Bosch. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and I couldn't think of a better way to close out this year, 2017, than with this interview episode. It's the only interview I've ever done in my life where I got off the line and I went and ran for five miles. I was so pumped up just from the work ethic, the discipline, the inspiration, the continuing to find new projects and opportunities and explore new things in music and outside of music with marathon running, you name it. Leon Bosch is one of the most fascinating musical figures out there today. And I'm going to stay brief here. I want to dive right into our conversation with Leon. He's somebody that I recommend whenever someone discovers the podcast and they ask, what should I check out? Leon is one of the first episodes I recommend to people. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Leon Bosch. Let listeners know a little bit about your early years and where you grew up. I always assume that everybody knows that part just because yeah. I... <laughs> of course. <laughs> Maybe just tell us the story of your early years, just briefly. Yes. Look, I, I was born in a township in Cape Town, mm -hmm. in, on the Cape Flats. The Cape Flats is a sort of dusty wasteland, you know, where nobody really wants to be, and they dump people, and, you know, that's where I was born and grew up. But I was fortunate to grow up in a time when my parents' generation had a very principled view of the world. I mean, I don't know how they did it, but they were kind of generations ahead intellectually. They understood what it was that made the difference for future generations. My father understood the importance of education, and not just conventional education, but also the question of learning other languages. So we, as kids, got to learn to speak German. Well, we learned lessons in German. Also, he decided that we should learn music. I mean, he didn't play any music at all. He was musically illiterate. But he bought the contents of a, a music library that was shutting down. Mm -hmm. All the 2,000 records and whatever else he could find, and he borrowed a vehicle to bring it all home. And, I mean, poverty was the order of the day. Most kids who lived around us were like stick people. They didn't have enough to eat, and they looked impoverished. Mm -hmm. But my parents spent whatever money they could to ensure that we were A, healthy, B, that we had access to good education. And they paid for music lessons. They bought a piano. I don't know how they did it. I mean, my father was prevented from working in most areas of endeavor, he, first of all, was a teacher, and he was banned by the South African regime from teaching. And every profession that he then pursued, he was banned from pursuing because the state deemed him to be too dangerous. And my mother, of course, was the one who kept the family together. She was initially a school teacher, then she became a nurse, and then she went to teach again. And the curious thing is that she actually taught to the primary school where I was a student. And in the township where we lived, across the road, they employed a policeman who kept 24-hour watch on our house to make sure who came to visit, who didn't visit, and anybody came to visit would be arrested and questioned. So we never had any visitors. My father was continually under, under what, uh, banning orders, mm. under the so-called Suppression of Communism Act. I mean, you know, this was used by the apartheid regime as a cover for brutality. So the situation was that he was only allowed to leave the house at, I think it was 7 o'clock in the morning to go to work, and he had to be back in the house by 5 p.m. or 5.30 p.m. No visitors. And anybody who came to visit had to stand outside and talk to us over the fence. So, I mean, I met his parents, my grandparents. Then they came to talk to him, their son, over the fence. They could never come into our house. The other thing I remember from, my, from growing up was, as a kid, I thought I'd had these dreams about men in dark suits in my bedroom. Or, well, the bedroom I shared with my siblings. But actually, these men that came to the bedroom were the special branch. So... Every month there was, well, there's a list of literature which is illegal, and every month they updated it, and they were hoping to find banned literature in your home so they could arrest you and stick you in prison. So they would raid our house at least once a month when the new list of banned literature was published. Uh, so these were the kind of conditions in which I grew up. But I was very fortunate to be surrounded by people who had this vision of the world. They also understood the question of talent. You know, nowadays there are many books written about what talent is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Daniel Coyle's book, uh, called The Talent Code, talks about how it's a physiological process. Yeah. So my parents knew how to enable a whole generation of young people to be able to do things. So, I mean, I, I'm skipping around you, but I, when I look back and I look at some of the kids that were at school with me, and I look at what's happened in their lives, they were taught some very basic things. They've all succeeded in everything that they chose to do. Their discipline, and their work ethic, and their principles. Life was not just about self-indulgence for any of them. And a lot of them suffer quite terribly because... Living in those uh, brutal conditions, I mean, I, as you probably know, I was a political prisoner at the age of 15. Yeah. All I did was to protest against the apartheid regime and to agitate for, for democracy. 
And that was sufficient to land me in prison. At the age of 15, I was arrested by a special branch at 3 o'clock in the morning, taken to Caledon Square, and put on trial. And the, the irony is that our lawyer at the time, um, Mr. Dula Omar, became the first Minister of Justice in the newly democratic South Africa in 1990. Wow. <laughs> yes. But as things turned out, because of my experience with Dula Omar, my lawyer, in the way that he defended the 10 of us who were involved in this particular trial, I felt that it was my mission in life also to become a lawyer to defend those who were unable to look after themselves. Mm. But at that time, it was for people of my color, which of course the wrong color according to the public regime, we had to have uh, to apply for a permit to study at university. You couldn't just go to university, you had to apply for permission. And I was denied permission to study law. And during the little holiday between the end of school and the start of university, I went on a national youth orchestra course in South Africa. And that experience made me think, well, actually, I really enjoyed this whole, it was like a party, you know, mm -hmm. meeting a lot of people and playing music and, you know, doing things I'd never done before. And I thought, well, maybe I should study music. So just as a prank, I applied for a permit to study music and I was granted one. And I went to university and I played an audition for the cellist and composer Alan Stevenson. I was at that point a cellist. And I mean, the audition didn't go that well. I mean... Even I, who knew nothing about music at that point, realized that a minor catastrophe had unfolded in this audition. <laughs> but as it turned out, Alan Stevenson must have spotted something, and he offered me a place at university. And that was the start of my musical career. I have to say that my life has since then been a succession of these kind of chance collisions and unusual events which take me in a direction which then proves to be unbelievably fulfilling. So you enter and you're playing the cello and tell us about the discovery of the bass and what, what drew you to this instrument? Well, I mean, I wasn't particularly drawn to the instrument. It's the instrument that came to find me. And I think it's the same for most people who end up doing something. It's not often one finds somebody who at a particular says, I'm going to be such and such and that's what they end up doing. Okay. Somehow there's a journey. And in my case, my cello teacher was a lady called Edna Elphick. She was a British-born cellist who had been a student of Pablo Casals. And she had left Britain to go to what was then, you know, well, actually, it wasn't any longer a colony, but, you know, one of the ex-colonies of the United Kingdom. And she taught the cello. And she also played in the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra, where she was principal cello for a while. In any case, uh, I auditioned to go to university, as you know, and she was going to be my teacher. And there was my first year as a cello student. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree bass or even a student bass or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the good folks at Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Eric and Gary and the whole Upton team, I can't say enough good things about them. And they have been on board with the various endeavors I've done online from the start. They were one of the early sponsors of the blog back in 2006 and 2007. And it has been so fun to follow along with their journey and see them develop these new models of basses like the Car Bass, the Bostonian, the Bohemian, and to connect with all these amazing players. I've had the privilege of speaking with so many people that play Upton Basses from Eric Rivas of Branford Marcellus's band and Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, all the way over to Anthony Monzo of the New Century Chamber Orchestra and Kevin Smith, Willie Nelson's bass player. I've had many students purchase Upton basses over the years. I've had a lot of colleagues play Upton basses. I see them on gigs all the time. They play great and Upton stands behind their work. Can't recommend them highly enough. Check them out online at uptonbass.com. Now, the crazy thing is that when I arrived at university, I realized the incredible deficit that I had in terms of everything, especially musical education. I'd grown up in a township, and township education was completely and utterly deficient compared to the kids that were music college. The kids at music college had been to specialist schools. They could play the instruments well. They could compose. They knew everything. I knew zero. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I decided that I had two options. I could either 
leave straight away, give up, or I could fight. And I decided to fight. And the way I fought was that every morning, by about 7.15, I walked through the front doors of the University of Cape Town, the South African College of Music, and I didn't leave till after 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week for four years. And that made the difference. But, you know, how did the bass come about in that whole process? I was practicing Shostakovich, cello sonata, and Brahms E minor, and that was my program for my first year exam. Mm -hmm. But after one of my lessons, Edna Elphick said to me, Leon, I'd like you to come to the Baxter, and this was the concert hall across the road from the college, tomorrow morning in the coffee shop, I'd like you to meet somebody. And as a dutiful 16-year-old, I turned up at the appointed time, and there was this very tall gentleman wearing glasses. She said, meet Zoltan Kovacs. Zoltan is the principal double bass of the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. And I thought, well, what's going on here? Why do I have to meet him? And Zoltan said to me, Leon, show me your left hand. And I extended my left hand and said, yes, you will be a bass player. Come for your first lesson tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And I just, and I didn't question. I mean, look, kids nowadays are slightly more confident and they would question anything like that. I just turned up. And I'm glad that I did. I started lessons with Zoltan. He taught me for, at least for one year, and by the time I had one year's worth of lessons, the bass and I had become inseparable. Suddenly, for the first time in my life, I had decent teaching, somebody who told me the truth. When something was good, he said so, and he rarely said that. He always motivated you to do better. So that's how the bass came about. Uh, at the end of my first year, I played an exam, and he was in the panel. And at the end of the exam, he said, Leon, we spent enough time together, you're now going to study with Max Runner. And I was passed on to Max Room, my second teacher. And then in, my, in that year, I played my first concerto. He decided that I should play with the string orchestra concerto. That's how I became a bass player, purely by accident, but the most fortuitous accident. Absolutely. Well, and wow, coming in at 7 a.m. and not leaving till 10 p.m. You, you mentioned the talent code and the 10,000 hours. That's how yeah. you were, got your 10,000 hours in very, <laughs> in a very, yeah. very I mean, short this, window. Absolutely. This, I mean, this is what's curious. I mean, I... I began to realize that there was something physiological taking place. Mm -hmm. Because when I started practicing, I couldn't do something. But I persevered. I would take one thing at a time and try to master it. And usually by the end of the day, or you know, I had a, a particular habit. I had a way in which I worked. I worked intensely for 20 minutes. And then I'd leave the room, go away and sit down, think about it, and come back to 20 minutes more. I didn't work absolutely nonstop. I had concentrated periods. But they lasted all day. And I was always in that room, the room B17, which was the base room. And I began to realize that there was a moment where something clicked and suddenly I could do it. And then I insisted every day that I wouldn't leave the room till something magical had happened. Something new that I couldn't do had suddenly become possible. And looking back now, it was this whole process of myelinization that I had discovered. I knew that I was developing uh, instinctively or without being able to quantify what was going on. I somehow discovered that there were new neural pathways that were being encouraged and being enhanced. So, for example, the critical moments, I can remember playing Dragonetti in the concerto that is passed off as Dragonetti. I never learned to play harmonics. I was still in first, second, third, fourth position. And Zoltan had left the music of the Dragonetti concerto on the music stand. And it was 10 o'clock at night. All my work had been done, the orchestra was done, but I couldn't get home because traveling to the township at that time and I didn't trains was a bit difficult. I was waiting for a lift for my father. And I looked at this Dragonetti music on the stand and I thought, I'm going to play this. So I picked up the bass and stood in front of the mirror, the music stand, and I started playing. And I was really kind of, it was a spooky experience because suddenly every single note came out. And I kept playing it over and over and over and over in case it disappeared. And I don't know how much time had passed, but there was a knock at the door. It was my father. He said, look, where are you? I've been waiting for you. And I said, look, just hang on, listen to this. And I played in this Dragonetti piece. And that was how I finally just played the bass. It just happened. Nobody taught me specifically how to do anything. It just happened. Hours and hours, and suddenly it took off. Well, and you discovered, you discovered this way of working that, that worked for... And, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the Pomodoro technique, which what you're describing is like almost identical to that. It's this method, I think, 20, 25 minutes, I think is what they say, of total uninterrupted work. And one thing, then a five-minute break of just like clearing the mind. And do you still approach... Because you're learning so much repertoire with these new albums. Do you still work like that? Yeah, I mean, look, I have more music to learn now than at any time in my life. Yeah. In fact, at the moment, I'm working on a new piece, which I have to play in a few days' time. It's just been written, and it's an E major. It's complex. I had thought of asking the composer to put it into D major, but I, 
<laughs> this is the key that he decided he wanted. And I just, uh, I found solutions for it. All I had to do was to sit down and concentrate and I found solutions. But you know, with everything I do, anything is possible if you put your mind to it. We all have 24 hours a day and it's just a question of how we use it. The thing that I know as a human being is that the one thing that we all excel at is making excuses. Mm-hmm. And I'm no different in that respect to anybody else. But I do have an ability to focus. When I decide to do something, it's going to happen. If it takes five minutes, it will happen. If it's 10 minutes, if it's a day, if it's two weeks, three weeks, if it's 10 years, it's going to happen. But once I've made a decision that something is going to happen, it will. And learning new music, I mean, as you say, surveyor, 10 pieces. I learned it from scratch. There's a whole process involved. I have to, first of all, decide which piece I'm going to learn and why. Then I have to find uh, what is consistent in the music. And usually they manage to form, so I have to get them put into a readable form and then analyze structure, harmony, everything else, and then find technical solutions. And then the next stage is playing with the pianist and then discovering what it is I can't do about them. So there's a whole process. Uh, The more I do it, the quicker it becomes. My first recording... I played pieces I played most of my life. Mm -hmm. So I just turned up and played what I thought was an interpretation. But now it's very different. So I prepare in a completely different way also for something creative rather than something that is prepared. Not that what's creative is not prepared. It's just that there are far greater possibilities that I prepare for the spontaneous, which can be dangerous. (laughs) I love danger. I live very much on the edge with everything. I mean, I was just looking through some of the new pieces that I... I've played in the last 12 months. And it's probably, there's more music in that short list than in the repertoire that I played in the first 15, 20 years of my career. And that's just in the last 12 months. A few concertos, a few pieces of bass and piano, a lot of stuff. And this amongst all the other new pieces I learn of the traditional repertoire also. So this phase that I mean, I'm learning some Beethoven sonatas just because the time has arrived for me to play Beethoven. And also Bach. I resisted playing Bach on the bass for so long because I had played it as a cellist. But I now have a very new way of dealing with Bach. You probably know that Schumann wrote piano accompaniments to all the Bach cello suites. And I first knew about these piano accompaniments when I was a young kid at the University of Cape Town. But in those days, to find things, you had to search physically. And I didn't find the music. And I renewed that search every 10 years, wherever I was in the world. When I found music shops, I went and looked for it. And then recently, I found the piano parts to all of them. So now I'm a teaching the Bach suites with piano accompaniment and also playing them. And there's a whole new way to see the world. And I find that really quite invigorating and inspiring. You have this mission. You have, you're on this quest. It's very clear that just you're, you're broadening the repertoire of the bass. Uh, when did this happen in your life that, that you d- decided to take this solo direction? I mean, I know a few years ago you retired from Academy of St. Martin in the fields. Um, were you, when you were in your orchestra job, were you doing all this research? Or is this something you just committed to do at a certain point? Just talk us through that process. I mean, this kind of, uh, well, you know, Stefano Shasha, one of our colleagues who lives in Trieste and teaches there has nicknamed me, what, the Sherlock Holmes of the bass. <laughs> That's nice. Yes. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, compliment. But this whole curiosity thing started when I was a child. Yeah. Before I was a musician, I was curious about other things. I, uh, the first thing that I became really curious about was space exploration mm-hmm. at the age of seven or whatever it was. I went to our library and I read every single book they had about space exploration. I could tell you everything about the Soviet space program, everything about the Apollo space program. That was what I was really interested in. I wanted to become an astronaut, a scientist, a cosmonaut, whatever it was. But the music thing, again, I remember when I was at university, people have holidays, and I never took a holiday at university. I mean, I, even in my professional life, I never take holidays. My wife is uh, very upset by this whole way I live my life. But I don't take, I'm always doing something. Even when I go on holiday, I'm doing something. Right. I'm either investigating something or running a race or something. But, so for example, the first official holiday we had at university in Cape Town, I set up a little chamber music festival. So I got everybody who happened not to be going home because they couldn't go home, home was too far to play chamber music. I bought music and found music in the library of pieces that nobody else knew and nobody had played. And also with the bass itself, I started off by playing all the standard uh, repertoire, Botticini, Dragonetti, all the things that everybody else plays. But I soon realized that actually there was more to life and indeed the double bass than just the traditional route. And I began to go off the beaten track and I found all these riches. And I played competitions when I was younger because I had to. I had no money. My parents were 6,000 miles away in Cape Town. I was in London. And I had to find a way to live. And the way I found to live was to play competitions. If I didn't win, I starved. The motivation was really strong. You probably know the story of Azarkin, the Russian bass player. Yeah. I always found something 
very touching about, about the way that he played. And he uh, listened to that re the first record that he made with the Glear Town Tunnel and Number the Lonely Heart. Could make me cry. And I, I finally understood why when I read about him. His life and the life of his family depended on him playing bass. And when something means that much to you, nothing is too much to do. And so with the bass, for me, it was never work. It was just a joy to find the music that everybody else had written for the instrument that they believed in. When somebody writes music for the, an instrument, they are sharing something with the world, something they truly believe in. And it's my duty as a human being to bring that to other people and not to disparage it or to pass a judgment. I think it's very dangerous. And we live in the 21st century where it is easy to be judgmental. One hears musicians talk about second-rate music, third-rate music, and, you know, the, the great masters. I don't have that view, that everything is a masterpiece, and it is one's duty to reveal what is special about it. So, for example, if you look at Severa, Severa believed in something. He wrote 62 pieces for the instrument. They were lost for a long time, and they were rediscovered by his grandson, Carlos. Somebody had to play it. Somebody had to take the time to reveal this beautiful stuff to the world. And for me, it was a joy to be able to do it. Same with Pedro Valls. Pedro Valls wrote more than just the sweet Andalusia. There are composers in Britain, for example. I've, I was actually quite interested in this particular thing. You know that my second disc was the British double bass. Mm -hmm. There's a, an unbelievable wealth of music written during the 20th century for the double bass. For, uh, and I, I've only recorded about is it 15 of those pieces. But what I discovered was there was this real treasure trove of which only the surface had ever been disturbed. Most people knew of David Ellis' sonata, Opus 42, which became famous because it was the test piece for the double bass competition, The Isle of Man. But there's so much more. And I wish I had the time, and I wish that there were more money. I mean, we live during very austere times, so it is very difficult to fund projects, which have no commercial kind of benefit to anybody, really. But intellectually, musically, and in terms of social gain, they are really important. So all the money I ever earned in my life, I've spent on music, books, making recordings, doing things which I believe need to be done and that maybe won't get done because everybody else is too uh, consumed by just trying to live. Yeah. This journey has been going on all the time. Whilst I was in the Academy for 20 years, I had a way of dealing with touring because, you know, the Academy spends 90% of its time traveling. It plays very little in London. If it's in London, it's either in the, record, in the recording studio or one or two venues playing concerts and they prefer not to play concerts in London because they lose money. So they tour the world. But I have a very, uh, I have a regime. We turn up every day in a new place, usually just after lunch, which means it's difficult to find the restaurant that's prepared to serve food. But my colleagues would all dash out as quickly as possible to the restaurant. And whilst they did that, I would walk to the hall and I'd get my base out of the flight case or whatever it was transported in and I would practice. And usually we would then have a short rehearsal before the concert, around about 4.30 or thereabouts. And I'm already there. And everybody just believes I got off the bus like everybody else to do the rehearsal. But I will have already have done at least a couple of hours practice. Then I do the rehearsal. We do the concert. And I go back to the hotel. Next morning, we're on a flight. We arrive in a new place and exactly the same thing. I go to practice. Free day. Everybody goes to see the cathedrals and the art galleries and everything else. I practice all day. Because usually, by the time we come home, I have a recital to play or a new concerto. And I have to look spend my time productively. So during all these years, traveling with the orchestra, I've always been working on projects and using my time to analyze scores or on the bus. It is easy to watch however many episodes of whichever television series is the most popular one. I never watched uh, any of these things. I would always be studying a score or doing something that you know needed to be done. But I have to tell you also that I don't do this all by myself. I have so many wonderful people to help me. For example, Manuscripts, to translate them and to understand them, is a complex process. Everybody has a unique handwriting. And I have an ex-student by the name of Carl Hind, who is like a forensic musicologist. The scores arrive, I send them to Carl. He puts them into Sibelius, so it's readable. I play them, and it's through playing them that I discover all the wrong notes and errors. We talk about what might be right or wrong. And through this process, he discovers how the composers write, their unique handwriting, the unique way they turn their pen, everything they do. So we together discover things about the human beings whose music we're playing and transcribing. So a journey like this is not a personal thing. It involves many people. My relationship with Silveira's family is a wonderful relationship. 
Also with new music, I have this relationship with the composers. I am not sure if you know the composer Arturo Quelia. He's Colombian, and he lives in Switzerland. No, I'm not familiar. He made his, uh, or he worked, he started as a mus musician, he studied in London, and then became an art dealer in Switzerland. But he always was attracted to music throughout that time, and eventually he decided to return to music. And he composes, and he's a conductor. But he wrote a concerto for me, uh, with the orchestration of the Eureka Symphony, a concerto for double bass. And it was interesting, actually, because I was very busy at the time when the premiere had already been scheduled. It was scheduled for September last year. And in the week before the concert, I was in St. Petersburg conducting, or learning to conduct, with Maestro Polishuk, who was the heir to the throne of Musin, a very famous conducting teacher. And this concerto arrived one page at a time. It started with the coda of the finale, then the pen penultimate page, and so it went until just a few days before the concert, I received the exposition of the first movement. And I learned one page per day. I arrived in South, in South Africa where the premiere was taking place with Apollon's Symphonia. And I, on the day I arrived there to meet the composer. We were being interviewed on television to talk about his piece and I played little bits for him. And as soon as I started playing bits for him, he began to smile. At which point I realized that I had actually done with his music what he expected. You never know till the composer is in the room with you and you play the music whether you misinterpreted completely and utterly what they've written. And I was so encouraged because after the first rehearsal, he told me, I'm going to rename this piece. And I said, what, what are you going to call it? He said, I'm going to call it Concerto Number 1. Oh, and nice. This was yeah. The most beautiful compliment anybody could pay a musician who's just spent some time trying to get to the bottom of what you've written. So that's my duty. As it is not about anything other than expressing something about human life and to translate into a meaningful form something that somebody else believes. I love the idea of everybody everybody going off and watching TV and exploring the cathedrals, and then you, you go and you're practicing, and your 10,000 hours become 20,000 hours. And third, there's a, there's, now, now I understand how you're able to work at this, at this incredible pace. I mean, you've been doing it your whole life. Yeah, it's a habit. I mean, you know, grit is a habit. I mean, uh, with my new hobby, you, I mean, most of our colleagues who use Facebook will probably know that I have a new hobby, which is running marathons and ultramarathons. Mm -hmm. But this just reinforced the lesson for me, yeah. that it is easy to run junk miles. You have to work smart. The more intelligent you train, the better you run and the better your times and results. And it's the same with music. It is possible to be in a room and to play for enjoyment all day and not to have good outcomes. And with running, it's been the same. And I'm reminded every day when I go out for a run or when I practice that I have to use my time effectively. I let my listeners know that we were doing this interview, and I do have a couple of questions from listeners. That uh, Mark Ramirez, who's the uh, principal bass of the Gulbenkian Orchestra in Lisbon, he was wondering if you could maybe just speak a little bit about the history of bass in the UK and where you see where you see bass developing and going in in the UK. You know, I mean, the United Kingdom has a an interesting history with the double bass. Mm -hmm. That the most important figure in double bass playing in that became, curiously, probably is Dragonetti. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dragonetti influenced Beethoven, and you know, so we have a lot to thank Dragonetti for. Also, when Dragonetti came here, the, the Dragonetti bow was quite popular. But there's a school of thought in, that has persisted in the United Kingdom that double bass playing was about orchestral playing rather than solo playing. And especially during, the, I think, the early part of the 20th century, it was very much about orchestral playing, playing alone, also prior to that. But there was a kind of mini-revolution, which was ignited by, amongst others, Rodney Slatford, Thomas Martin, and other players of great standing. But before them also were a handful, like uh, Victor Watson and various other players uh, that composed it. There, of course, you probably know of Adrian Beers also. Adrian Beers was a double bass player for whom Benjamin Britten wrote these wonderful bass parts in his chamber operas and all his works that uh, Adrian did so beautifully. So it's a curious kind of mixture. Orchestral playing in Britain is one which has a unique kind of capability that most bass players in Britain could sit down and play anything that they haven't seen and do it very successfully. But his uh, solo playing has not always had the same degree of attention or necessarily the same finesse, or, but that has changed. But, you know, uh, the British school of bass playing is no different from any other school of bass playing. And there are things that are profoundly worrying about where bass playing is going internationally. You probably know also that the view of orchestral playing is that actually 
if you're going to be an orchestral player, you don't need to play your instrument as well as you would have to if you were going to play Tchaikovsky violin concerto, or you know, and the same applies to the bass. Look, Kusevsky concerto. You're not going to perform it with an orchestra, so it doesn't really matter. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Check out their Kaplan Strings, which have versatility and control throughout the entire dynamic spectrum. Rich tonal color palette, superb bow response, and beautiful balance. I've been using them myself on my bass for the last year or so and totally love them. They sound great pizzicato. They sound great arco. Folks like David Allen Moore of the Los Angeles Philharmonic use them. Brandino of Black Eyed Peas, he uses them. What fantastic strings. Thank you for sponsoring the podcast, D'Addario. This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. And the other thing which I find profoundly troubling about bass playing, and this is something that everybody's trying to correct, and I'm sure that every single pedagogue works on this particular thing, that the, music, the adult bass is just a musical instrument like any other. It is just a physical implement which we use to express something through sound. Mm -hmm. What is music? It is the expression in sound of human life. And everybody has a character. Everybody has they identifies with an instrument and with a sound. For me, the fact that I'm a double bass player is almost irrelevant. It's about the music. I just know that the instrument has become such a part of me that I find it very natural to express what I believe and how I feel about the world through the instrument. And in the British School of Bass Playing, in most of bass playing, there is this kind of disconnect. Thomas Martin describes it in particular. He says, firing at the wrong target. And I think that's a very good way to express it. With my students, I mean, I was, I was teaching all day at Trinity yesterday. And what is nice about the students at Trinity is that nobody's lesson is a private affair. Everybody sits in everybody else's lessons because they know that it will be a shortcut to learning the piece that somebody else is playing. They see all the mistakes and all the problems. They see the solutions. And by the time they get to learn that piece, they've learned they have a much quicker route to being able to articulate something. And it's always about the music. So I have articulated a very simple method for dealing with the elements that one needs to master in order to be able to play music. And it is no different for solo music or for orchestral music or anything else. And the way I came to this solution was because I had a student that was difficult to teach. He was an incredibly passionate musician, and he always tried to start with the imagination part in music before having mastered any of the other elements. So in order to make sure that he got better outcomes and was able to unleash his fire, musical fire and emotional fire, I gave him a very strict framework. The very first part of that framework was that he had to learn to play all the notes in time and in tune. That's it. No more. Just all the notes in time, in tune. And then the second stage wanted to accomplish that. And I didn't care whether uh, in time how fast it was or how slow, but just all the notes in time, in tune. The second stage was now to look at the, the notes in greater detail. Are those notes loud or soft? That's the question of dynamics. Are they short or long? The question of articulation. And then, of course, we have all the notes in time, in tune, short or long, loud or soft. So we in a stage two. Then the third stage was the question of music. Every note has a purpose. Is it going somewhere or is it coming from somewhere? Do we have a four-bar phrase, a two-bar phrase, eight bars? What does it mean? Is it in the tonic, in the dominant? Because key structure and tells us something. Is there modulation here? Is the final cadence? Those are the things to attend to. So stage three is the musical things, phrasing, all those other elements of beauty. And once all that's in place, then, of course, we attend to the final question, which is the esoteric question of the personal contribution, the artistry. And, of course, once we engage with this question of artistry, then it necessarily changes much of what we have already done before. And then it reminds us that when we start to learn a piece, we've already started with number four, because we play the piece, first of all, because we want to, we love it, we believe we have something unique to say in that piece. And then we return to number four once we've gone through the mechanical phases. And that will give us a much better outcome. And I have to say that it works so well for 
this student made me have to quantify this little system, and it works very well for everybody else. So when anybody plays anything, yeah, I will ask them, okay, so this little obstacle we have here is this stage one, two, or three obstacle. Then we know what we're fixing. It's very simple. So in how to compare the British school of bass playing with all the other international schools playing, the Czech school, the Hungarian school, everything else, I mean, they all have a new, unique flavor. What is the unique flavor of the British school of playing? The first thing is its prowess in orchestral playing, and also, as you know, the session business relies uniquely upon this incredible facility which British musicians have for playing anything quickly. And now the level of mastery of the instrument itself has skyrocketed. But if there's one thing that, is, that needs attention, I think, with young people, I'm a little troubled sometimes that they're not able to fulfill all the aspects of being a complete musician. It is not enough just to be a soloist or an orchestral musician or chamber music. You have to be able to do everything. Complete mastery takes dedication and focus. It means that you have to be working all the time. So the com and also this question of competition. There's an unhealthy view of competition. Competition ought not to be versus somebody else or something else. It is with yourself. Every day you get up, you have to be better than you were the day before. And unless you're making progress in that way, then there are questions to answer. So I try to encourage amongst my students this view that actually the competition they have is with themselves because competition versus others is very unhealthy. And just yesterday I was talking to a young female student about this. She was troubled by this question of sincerity when some, she felt that if somebody, usually fellow students, say to her before a concert, good luck, she wasn't sure that they really meant it. And the reason that it's possible that it wasn't sincerely meant is that there's this view that music is a zero-sum game. What somebody else gets is something that you're not getting. And of course, this is not true, because music is such an unbelievable thing that there's room for everybody. Because nobody is ever going to do the same as anybody else. We are all unique. The blueprint is the same, but the possibilities are endless. In the same way that with music, you take a handful of notes and you can create millions of pieces of music. So the British School of Playing is no different, really, in the challenges that it faces or its accomplishments. It just sees the world from a slightly different perspective based upon geography and history. I'd love to hear, and this is another question from, uh, from, from Mark, uh, just briefly, how has the double bass scene in South Africa changed? I mean, look, it's incredible that, that South Africa has had great bass players over the years. Um, in history, a long time ago, there were great bass players, and then there was a fellow period where most of the bass players came from abroad. And Zoltan Kovacs, my teacher, was one of those who came into South Africa because there's a shortage of good bass players. Then suddenly there were young people like me who began to play the bass and things happened. And because of that, everybody, a lot of other young people wanted to learn to play the instrument. Now we have an incredible situation that South Africa produces an enormous amount of great talent, not just on the double bass, but everything else. I mean, if you look at athletics, for example, you have kids from the townships that nobody's ever heard of who can go to the Olympics and win a gold medal at 400 meters, for example. And you saw Wade for Nick do that. And the thing that, is, that makes this possible is this deep motivation. They will see somebody do something, and then there's this moment of ignition, and they think, I want to do that. And they throw themselves in, in the, with a band, and they do whatever is necessary. And I never realized the extent to which it is a good example, is so powerful. I look at a lot of young bass players, and some of them are not so young anymore, and I ask them how it came about, and they always trace to a particular moment. They tell me about a concert that they heard, or they tell me about something I'd said to them when they were, however young they were. There's a young bass player in Chicago, by the name of Johann Schuster, for example. I first came across him when he came to play in a youth orchestra course in South Africa, one of these music projects, called Miyagi. Music is a great investment. When he turned up, he could barely hold the instrument. But there was something interesting about him, that every break he came to ask me questions. And when the day's tutoring had been done, he said, could I come and play for you? Would you give me a lesson? Would you do this? He was always pestering me. And he told me, look, I'm, I forget how old he was. He said, look, I, this is how old I am. I want to be a bass player. Is it too late? And I said, well, look, it's never too late to do anything. And he went away. And the following year, he turned up, and he was principal double bass of the orchestra. He had improved by a magnitude unimaginable. Today, he is one of the brightest, best prospects as a young bass player anywhere in the world. Likewise, there's a young chap whom I met at Stellenbosch Music Festival. He was 14. 
little disorganized technically, but there was something very special about him in the way that he played. He played for me Chasson Trist. His name is Ruan Bartman, and he came to London. I brought him to England because I felt that he, that's where he needed to be. He, came to, he studied the Houdemannian School with Caroline Emery and then went to the Royal Academy for a couple of years. And he has the potential, again, to be an extraordinary musician, an extraordinary dub bass player, and this just from little beginnings. So there's this powerful story about bass playing in South Africa, and what I think could possibly happen is that in a few years' time there will be a particular South African kind of school of bass playing with a particular focus on sound, how to phrase, how to do music, a particular vision of music. Just a f uh, last month, I was in South Africa to run the Two Oceans Ultramarathon. And there's a young woman bass player who always talks to me on Facebook, asking questions. She asked, could she have a lesson? But unfortunately, didn't work. she couldn't have a lesson because somehow I didn't work. But she came to see me. And I realized that she has no money at all. The way she learns the bass is by using two of the books I bought for her and gave as a present about a year ago. Botticini Etudes, Volume 1, and Khrabi. She can't afford lessons, so she just talks to people to hear things about what other people do and how they practice, and then she goes, every, she has a job. She works to earn a living. So she just goes to work an hour early every day, and her basis is in the changing room, and she practices for an hour, then works all day. And then at the end of it all, she practices some more and goes home. And actually, it is very humbling to realize the struggle that some young people have to go through to do something so simple as to learn to play an instrument. And I really wish that I could help more young people like this. But of course, it is not easy. It takes resources, time and money. So the South African School of Bass Playing is developing really quickly. There are some really wonderful people who teach with me. For example, Peter Guy, who is the man who started the Bochabella project, the Mongolian pro project, is a bass player, an American bass player, as it happens. And he has an incredible way of teaching people very quickly on the instrument up to a particular point, and then he passes them on. And Every one of these young people have been given by him a foundation which is really incredibly strong on which they can then build for the rest of their lives. So the South African School of Bass Playing will soon begin to affect the world and to be noticeable, yeah. I hope. I just got one, one last question for you, uh, and this is also from a, from a listener, Raymond Irving, and he was wondering about how you approach your concept of sound in an ensemble like orchestra versus playing solo. Does your sound concept change? Not really. I mean, uh, your sound is you. Everybody ha should have a unique sound. If your sound mm -hmm. sounds like anybody else, then it's not a sound, then it's noise. True art is based upon this individual thing of we have unique, we have fingerprints. Nobody's fingerprints are identical. Nobody's voice is identical. You, you can, with your eyes closed, identify the sound of your mother, your father, your cousins, everybody, because they are unique. Why should it be any different when we play an instrument? If we cannot distinguish one player from another, something is going wrong. And this is what I alluded to earlier. There's something going wrong in the whole music business. We're firing at perhaps the incorrect targets. And I try to do this with all my students, is to allow them to develop their own personal idea of sound, who they are. They have to express something deep from inside, not to sound like anybody else, but it has to be motivated by somebody else who has a unique sound. You probably know the, the video, The Great Violinists, where it starts with a bit of Mendelssohn violin concerto played by different violinists. It's the same piece, but it sounds like a different composition, because every one of them is completely unique. Now, in ensemble playing, orchestral playing and solo playing, what are the differences? In solo playing, it is completely and utterly you your view of the world. You play your arpeggio in whichever piece you're playing, your Botticini elegy, for how you really believe and understand it. Your sound has to tell the world who you are. Within a second, everybody has to know what you believe, your core beliefs, everything. What kind of human being you've developed into. Also, when you play in an ensemble, the role of the double bass in an ensemble, let's say trad quintet or Schubert octet or, or Beethoven septet, is unbelievably powerful. You have the power to direct where everybody goes through rhythm and providing foundation and also harmony and possibilities for phrasing. I will never forget, you know, playing Beethoven Septet with the Zuckerman chamber players, the Pink and Zuckerman leading the ensemble. And in the finale, I have a particular way that I see the sextuplet, the triplet figures, the fiddle players at the end. And I direct them by pushing a little here and taking back here. And and he is the only fiddle player in the world that was wise to what he was doing to the ensemble, directing them. He says, hey, hang on a minute. He says, 
you're going to push me over the edge. I can't go that quickly. But <laughs> this is the power that you have as an ensemble player. So, I mean, yesterday I was coaching an ensemble playing trout quintet, an ensemble of students. And the double bass player was putting in an enormous amount of energy, but failing in the fundamental role that the double bass should play in the trout. He was not directing the rhythm, the articulation wasn't as crisp as it might be. Also, when he had to be a harmonic instrument, he wasn't as harmonic as also the question dynamic. So you have to tailor things. What I like to hear when I hear an ensemble is without looking to know which double bass player is playing, uh, just from the question of bass playing. Also in orchestra, in the academy, playing be a Beethoven symphony with two double basses. You have an enormous role to play. First of all, you have to provide a huge body of sound because the wind section doesn't get reduced. It's just the string section, which is much, much smaller. When you have to play with that amount of sound and also crisp articulation to give, provide accurate rhythm, it requires you to be far greater than just a small cog in a big machine. In fact, you have to be driving the machine. So the way that I played in the academy is no different in terms of commitment and understanding and intellectual power and musical power than from when I play my solo pieces. It is the music that benefits. Just to take a little small example, if you think of the scherzo entry of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and this is something that every bass player learns because that is what's in auditions. What are the challenges of those two little bits scherzo? What kind of sound do you need to make? What bowing and articulation is going to help you provide rhythm The first two notes and cruises to down with in three one two three one two three one two three you have to feel that. And then comes the trio and everybody wants to be virtuous. They want to play that as fast as possible. It's a mistake. What is important in the trio is that there has to be the sense of struggle between one in a bar and three. Taka tika taka tika taka taka ti in pam pam pam. One two three one two the pop pop. And you cannot play that successfully without understanding what it really means. Draganetti knew what that meant. Carlos Kleiber knew what that meant. If you listen to the relationship that Carlos Kleiber has between his scarce and his trio, then you know that he has understood what Beethoven intended. So before we play anything, we have to have an intellectual concept. There has to be an honesty. It's not just about trying to impress the world. And I think that is part of this little target that, you know, everybody's firing at. Impress the world. But actually, much more impressive is the integrity and the duty we have to music. And it reminds me, last night I went to hear the Borodin String Quartet play at Wigmore Hall. They played Shostakovich and Beethoven. And it was like a glimpse into this incredible past of the Soviet Union, the artistic achievements of a generation of people who devoted themselves completely and utterly to music in a principled manner. And that's our duty. So when you play in uh, solo, when you play concert, of course, you have to play loudly because you have a whole orchestra behind you that could drown you. So your dynamic range has to, or the upper end of your dynamic range has to be pretty brave. When you play recitals, you have the opportunity to play incredibly quietly and also incredibly loudly and also beautifully. And when you play with a good pianist, they will challenge you to do all those things. When you play in a small ensemble, you have to play with confidence and also to know what your duty is in the ensemble. And when you play in an orchestra, chamber orchestra, you have a duty also to provide this clarity of rhythm, harmony, and also directing. Phrasing in the fiddles can be affected so much. I mean, I don't think bass players usually understand the power that they possess. And power, of course, can be abused <laughs> at the same time as being responsible. That's going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. I'm so glad to have you here. And if you'd like to get in touch, email me at feedback at contrabassconversations.com. I respond to each and every email I get, and I love to hear guest ideas, topic ideas. That would be fantastic. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet. You can go to our website, contrabassconversations.com slash subscribe, or just go to our website. You'll find the link right there. And if you would like to help out the show, the number one thing you could do to help out this show, Controversy Conversations, is tell a friend. Tell a student, tell a colleague. They can be a bass player, a non-bass player. That would be so helpful for helping this show grow. If you haven't checked out our archive of over 400 episodes, you can get our Controversy Conversations app. That is ControversyConversations.com slash app, or just search for us in the app store of your choice. That's going to do it for today's episode. I'm Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.